Okay, good morning, everybody, and thank you so much for um, this opportunity to be here with all of you for this um, very intriguing group of people. I enjoy the Sabbath schools every time um, I am not scheduled somewhere else here at Walla Walla, for example. Yeah, so my background, I was born in Romania and uh, in a context of people who have lived there, uh, German people who have lived there for hundreds and hundreds of years back, about 800 or more. And um, this is central, the central p uh, part of the country. I lived there for 21 years and during the time of Ceausescu when uh, the country was closed and we did not have any chance to travel or uh, to have really good information from uh, the world. And uh, so uh, when I was 21, my family was able to come out and uh, my parents, my brother and I, and we moved to Western Germany um, in the um, southwest corner in Freiburg, close to Switzerland and France. It was the time to decide what I would uh, want to do with my life. And um, I decided to go to Austria, to Bogenhofen, for uh, studying um, in our seminary over there. I came back to Germany and I became a pastor and then continued uh, studying for another two years and passed it again, and then had the opportunity to come to the United States to Andrews for my PhD in Old Testament. Um, after that, um, basically almost in the middle of it, I got called to move to the Philippines, to our school in the Philippines. So I have taught over there for six years before I came here to Walla Walla University. And so I'm here since 2014 and enjoying the, the place and the time, every year a little new to uh, enjoy all kinds of things that happen around us. So this is in very brief my, uh, my life so far. I have a family, I'm married, I have two children. So the story of Cain and Abel, I came about this story because of that short incident that I wrote about in my brief article that I that was set up on uh, the website. And um, I, I had not planned to do this uh, particular uh, story from the Bible, from Genesis 4, but it was interesting to hear this connection that is made currently and has been done for um, many, many years in relation to the conversation about gun rights, gun use, and so on. By the way, I am not going to enter into the issues of American laws about guns or uh, that kind of very loaded and very difficult conversation. What I am trying to do is to see how the story of Cain and Abel has been misused, if you will, and what we actually can take out from a story like this uh, from the biblical text. Uh, that is my intention. So I'm not going to talk about the shootings in that sense and the reasons for it or um, any other uh, issues involved in that but uh, we are going to um, read and learn about Cain and Abel in the Bible and how the, this biblical story, um, what, what kind of things we can take away from it. So those are the major ideas that I would like to put up here in, in front so that I do not, so that everybody had, doesn't have a wrong uh, way of understanding what, what I'm going and trying to do. So I hope we can stay with that conversation of the biblical story. And then uh, it is to each one of us left afterwards uh, what, what will be taken away from it into the conversation about um, use of violence and so on. Cain and Abel is that uh, part where 
we come out of the Garden of Eden and we learn about the story of the parents who have um, two sons at first and then there will be a third one at the end. The picture that I put up here is a painting by um, William Blake who has done a wonderful uh, images, paintings of biblical stories and also um, which, which emphasis on how a story like this can, can be um, conceived and received by the viewer if we are able to recognize also the emotional aspects of it, uh, the way the chapter and the story puts that together. So it is uh, always a work of art and not just a simple uh, storytelling that we have maybe grown up with as children. So for example, what you see here is Cain, of course, in the front, fully like uh, out of, <laughs> uh, fully emotional and distraught, um, yet his body is perfectly sculpted into the picture here. In the background, you have uh, the father, uh, Adam, who does not, figure in the in the text except for fathering the children um, but then you have a uh, laying down on the ground you have uh, Abel who is laying flat on the back and then the mother Eve who is hung over uh, the sun her hair is like connecting and going into the hair of the child that uh, is killed that she has lost and in the front of the picture, you have that perfectly uh, lined out grave, if you will, where the body is going to be laid. Just to like enter into this story with, with uh, the idea and with the context of a well-written uh, text, a text that needs to be not just read, but studied and studied in a way that we recognize features that are present in the text and also those that are not present in the text. So on the next slide that I'm uh, introducing here, uh, scholars who have studied a story like this, and these are mainly Bible scholars of uh, Jewish origin and uh, read the text in its original form uh, in the Hebrew language, give us a little bit of an insight how this story is full of gaps of literary features that figure prominently in it, and then others that are left out, uh, gaps and silences in the story. And we need to recognize those to understand what the story is wanting to achieve and wanting to give to us. So I'm going to point out several of those elements here because they are the ones that make up the story. So here is how we get to be introduced to the text of Genesis 4. And on the one side, you have the official New American Standard Bible 1995 translation. And that is how it reads in chapter 4, verse 1. The man had relations with his wife, Eve. And she conceived and gave birth to Cain, and she said, I have gotten a man child with the help of the Lord. Now, when I read this first to in, in my classroom, students start to chuckle, start to laugh. Man child? Well, what is that? <laughs> and uh, nobody takes it seriously when you start reading the story with that word starting out there. And then after that word man child, what you see in that verse is also those three words, at least three, and they are put here in this Bible in cursive, in italicized letters. That is an indication that they are missing, that they are actually not there in the Hebrew text. So on the other side of the, of the um, table here, you have um, a somewhat more closer translation of this text. So here is how the Hebrew text would read in a closer reading in English. Now the human, and this is Adam, Adam, not Adam necessarily as a name, but Adam as a human being. And he, this is how he is described throughout chapter one in Genesis, 
especially also in chapter two, and then uh, to la a large part also in Genesis chapter three. Now we come to chapter four, and he is still that human being, and he knew his new Eve, his woman or wife. It's the same word. You have to always read it in context to recognize uh, how the relationship is between the man and the wife. And then it makes sense if it is a woman that is separate or a woman that is with him and is close with him in, an, in a relationship. So she conceived and she gave birth to Cain. And pay attention, he knew Eve. And I think as Adventists, we, I hear that a lot. Uh, pastors pointed out, out that, that word to know in that most intimate sense here. And in an, in, I would add to that, yes, it is all about an intimacy to know um, the woman, but to know the woman in such a way that the, uh, the aftermath is a birth, a child that is coming out of that. So she gave birth to Cain and she said, I have acquired, I have created, I have brought forth. English translations will also of course say, I have gotten. And then what is that? What she has acquired, created, brought forth. This is an, a man, not a man child. This is an ish. That's the Hebrew word for a man, a human adult man. Leaving out all those words in italics, the next expression that is actually in the text is the four Hebrew letters YHWH, which is uh, the word that we have in our English Bibles for Lord with four capital letters, L-O-R-D. So that is how we are introduced to the story. And already in the first verse, we have a whole amount of words that needed explanation, that needed some kind of a, a way to understand something, to interpret something. So yes, it's not an easy chapter that we are going to read. She brought forth one and she called him Lord. We would need to go back to Genesis 1, 2, and 3 to find out what we can do with that idea. But since that is not our topic today, uh, I would just say the following. If she felt that this is someone that she can call Lord Yahweh, then he surely doesn't turn out as Yahweh Lord throughout the story. So, so much about this first verse. Uh, maybe later on in the questions, um, we might be able to come back to it. So the next slide is the, that part that gives us the outer parts of the entire story. And I would like to make the point that this story in Genesis 4, it would be with little value to read it verse by verse and just go through it from the beginning. Unless we go and read the entire story to the end and may, maybe even further out of it, and then we would have to go back into the story. That is what makes biblical storytelling so interesting that you will always be surprised by something that comes later. So you are not able to make sense of things if you just read it sequentially and go through it. You have to go through it and then go back to it from the end. In other words, you read it from the front and from the end. And so you get kind of like a rounded picture. So what you have here is Eve. And she says, she calls her first son Cain because she felt the, she got, she brought this, him forth with, uh, uh, and it is the Lord. At the end of the story, she has one. And again, we hear her voice and she says, God has granted me another child, 
in place of able. And this one is called Seth, and that is the explanation that she gives for his name because he is appointed. The, the word Seth, the name Seth, it has that meaning to appoint. And that is what we learn here in the from the end part. But in addition to that, maybe it's also good to understand that the tragedy of Genesis 4 that is explored throughout the entire chapter is bracketed by the voice of the mother, the one who gives birth, the one who uh, puts children into the world and she suffers pain and she suffers loss. And so her voice is that one that we receive. And I do think that is an important element because you see, whenever there is news, news about some big event, like the news that we get about the um, children that die, it comes to us with that voice of the people who mourn, the people who have lost those children. And in the biblical story, this is the mother, this is Eve. On this slide, we learn about the three sons. Cain is the first one, and we get an explanation for his name. We read that already. The second one comes short after this. His name is Abel in our English language. And for him, we do not hear any explanation from the mother, who he is and how she got to have him. It's just she gave birth to his brother. So already there, Abel is called the brother of Cain, the first one. And then we are told that his name is Abel, which in the Hebrew text is the word Hevel. And this word, in the meaning that we will learn later in the biblical text, has, has that idea of something that is fleeting and um, a vapor, a vanity, something that just evaporates and goes away. And then the last, last son also has an explanation. So we already get the idea of the son who is going to disappear. So we learn uh, about, uh, first about Cain, um, what his profession is. We learn that he is the worker of the ground. Uh, the ground is that element that God has used to create Adam. And so ground is Adama. And so Adam, the human being, is directly related to that ground, to that earth. And so many commentators uh, will speak of the human being, Ad, uh, Adam, as the earthling or the groundling even, because the language is so intricately connected in there. And this this first man, this ish man, Cain, is a worker of the ground. Now, if we ask that the question about the profession that he fulfills, it is just that that God had given as a task to the human being, to Ha'adam, before he sent him out of the Garden of Eden. And you find that verse in Genesis 3.23. So in that sense, Cain is doing nothing else than actually doing what God asked them to do, to work the ground, to serve the ground, to take care of the ground, and so on. So this is, this is the first thing that we learn about Cain. In the next slide, um, we learn about Abel. And about him, it is said that he is a shepherd or a keeper of the flock. And about that, we did not have a direct connection unless we want to see in Genesis 3, verse 21, uh, that verse where it speaks of that God made garments for, of skin for Adam and his wife, and he clothed them. So if we interpret that with the slaying of an animal, then we would have a reference point for Abel's profession back into Genesis chapter three. 
Again, it is a matter of interpretation. Uh, it is also uh, something pr maybe that we could derive from Ellen White's description of the story in, the, in this sense, but it is not directly and clear in the text. On the next slide, <clears throat> I'm trying to give and show uh, the impression that we get when we read these first five verses in the story through in such a way that we get to know Cain and we get to know Abel. But I want us to pay attention how the, uh, the story is like referring to them and how that is going in almost like in a rhythm, in a cycle. It goes up and down, up and down through the story. So a story like this is something that would have to be told orally for the people to be heard with their ears and not necessarily read with their eyes. Because when you hear it with your ears, then you hear, so she gave birth to Cain. And I have Cain, which is the word for gotten or created or acquired a man. And then the next is she gave birth to his brother Abel and Abel was a keeper of the flock. And then the story goes back to Cain. Cain was the tiller of the ground. And Cain is the one who brought an offering for the Lord. And then it goes back to Abel. And Abel also brought an offering. And then uh, the question is how the Lord is looking at these. So there is this up and down and back and forth in the oral hearing of the story that is so much more appealing if we would be able to hear that in its original form and listen to the story in that sense. So we do have to imagine the story being performed, maybe on a stage, maybe on, in a theater, in front of the people, and then they listen to it, and that is how they learn about it. In the next uh, piece here, we get to hear the Lord speak. We have not heard the Lord in this way. The last time it was in Genesis chapter three. And in that case, the Lord is the Lord God. And he is driving the man out of the garden of Eden and even uh, closing up that entrance. In chapter four, we have Yahweh, speaking Yahweh, the one, is it the one that Mother Eve said, I gave birth or I created a man, Yahweh? Well, again, it would be interesting to listen to it as a hearer, as a listener, and hear that word now used for the second time only in this story after it comes out of the mother's mouth. But now this Lord speaks to Cain and he asks some questions to ask. He says, why are you angry? Why has your face fallen down? And then this verse is one that the Oxford Bible, um, which is an NRSV translation actually, um, the most recent scholarly Bible has a footnote in there just saying, this is one of the most difficult verses. It's unclear uh, how to actually translate it. So uh, Bible translators will come up with ways to put here that, uh, that, that if idea into the text and say, so is it not so kind of, you would have to imply that hearing in that question. Is it not so, if you do well, it lifts up, it, it is risen, it rises or it is lifted up. And this is all about the face. In our English Bibles, this will be the word countenance sometimes. In the Hebrew Bible, this is the face is fallen down, kind of like a frowning face. Today, we have all these emojis that we throw out on our, on our uh, social media. So we have those, those, those little circles with the head. And you have a, a smiling face, you have a frowning face, you have a sad face, an angry face. Maybe that helps us moderns uh, a bit to understand what is going on here. We could put actually here that kind of angry and 
very frowning face of, uh, of that emoji into the text. So if you do well, it is lifted up. But if you do not do well, sin is crouching at the door and its desire is for you. But you may, can, should, all kinds of words are possible here, master it. And also the word for sin is here used for the first time in the Bible. We do not have it in Genesis chapter three. This is the first time that we actually hear about sin. And yet we call Genesis three as that story about the fall into sin. Now, yes, there are connections between chapter three and chapter four, but still, it is this one here that for the first time gives us the language for sin. Chapter three was all about being afraid, uh, having to uh, cover up. Uh, shame is part of it. Blame is part of it, and so on. And the hiding, of course. But it is here where we learn the language of sin. Chatat. The Hebrew word is that one which is laying like, and in some verses, this is the, uh, the image that is put up there. It is laying or crouching and is laying in wait at the doorstep. And it is, its desire is to, for you to get you. So that is usually the, the commentator's interpretation here about this, this specific verse. So that is the Lord entering into the story here, Yahweh, who is speaking now to Cain, and Yahweh will speak to Cain again and again. He will never speak to Abel. Yeah, I think I mentioned this before. So this is a very ambiguous way of that element at the end where we can read, you shall master it, or you must master it or you may master it and so on. Again, uh, this, this, this expression here is not clear and uh, up, you know, straightforward. So of course, in our um, storytelling, we as um, Bible readers with the Bible and the Christian addition to the Hebrew Bible, will always and often ask the question, so what, what happened here? And what is it that made Cain so angry? And often we conclude that, well, it's the Lord. He looked with, no, with regard, with uh, wealth, with favor upon Abel's offering, but he looked without that kind of regard and favor onto Cain's offering. So then we go from there and we will uh, uh, say, so what is it that made Cain's offering into something that would have been wrong so that the Lord couldn't uh, um, accept it? Well, here are a few things to that question. Sacrifices, offerings in the Bible, yes, were brought by Abel from the animals and by Cain from the firstlings of the flock and from the fat pieces of the, of the animal. That's what the story says. But there is no way to stay with that uh, element so closed up because we will learn about sacrifices in many, many places in the Torah, outside of the Torah, in the Old Testament, all along. And we will learn throughout many, many uh, parts of the Bible that sacrifices could be from animals and also from non-animals, like from plants, like um, grains, uh, oil, even grapes. And they are all mentioned and they are most of the time offered in the tabernacle, in the temple, um, in, a, in a way that they come together often. Uh, so if we learn about the burnt offering, uh, then a, a, a grain offering could accompany that or any other of those offerings uh, from, the, from, the, from plants, for example. And I put up um, just, an just a selection of verses. There are 
many, many more that we could cite there from Leviticus numbers and so on. So still, we are still left with the question, so what is wrong with Cain's sacrifice, but Abel seemed to be okay for the Lord? I would look into this question with that principle of reading the story in the wider context of offering sacrifices. And in that wider context, we do learn when sacrifices are accepted by God and when sacrifices are not accepted by God. God has ordered them, according to Leviticus chapters 1 to 7, God is asking for them. And yet there are times and there are uh, stories and moments when God says, no, I do not accept your offerings. Even when they are performed correctly, even when they are performed in the right way, even the animal sacrifices that are killed in the right way or uh, prepared in the right way, God will call them worthless offerings in Isaiah 1 verse uh, 13 and in also uh, several other places there and say, I will not accept them. Uh, Jeremiah will do the same. Jeremiah will say to the people, you can come and offer as much as you want if you do not come with the right attitude and also if you do not have your life or, uh, ordered in such a way that it is in harmony with an offering to God. And especially in Isaiah and in Jeremiah, what does that mean? For the, in the two prophetic books, to offer a sacrifice in the temple needs to be preceded by a life of justice and righteousness. And that life of justice and righteousness is measured on the facts on how a person would treat people who are the most um, needy or the most marginalized so Isaiah, Jeremiah, and many other prophets will speak about them. Uh, the poor, the widow, the orphan, the foreigner, the immigrant, the uh, refugee, and so on. He will call them by those words and say, if you don't treat them well, then I will not accept your sacrifices. You can come and offer them as much as you want. They are considered worthless, and I even loathe them, says uh, God in, in a few places. Jesus will make that point as well in the Gospels, and he will speak about um, before you come to the temple to offer a sacrifice, make sure you reconcile with your brother. So I think Jesus' story, uh, Jesus' reference there in Matthew 5 can be very much uh, read in connection to the Cain-Abel brother story. And also when Jesus uh, speaks about the offerings that they would bring to the temple and while doing that, not uh, um, being negligent and uh, not taking care enough of the parents, the mother and the father, uh, you have to do that first and then you can come and bring an offering. So those are a few places that I believe uh, give us so, uh, so much better understanding what is going on in the question about Cain's offering. His, his um, frowning and angry uh, face is an indication that there is something going on that was not about the sacrifices not being accepted, but it was something that preceded that uh, act of sacrificing of offering. And that would be then the contextual reading of that uh, story of Cain, where the Lord um, does not look or take notice or gaze upon his offering, but does gaze upon Abel's offering. So, so much about that, that uh, part. And then we come basically to the I believe to the high point of the story in Genesis 4, this is verse 8. And here we get, an, get to have an introduction to that um, uh, terrible act that takes place. Cain said to Abel, his brother, 
so what you have here is um, the translation from the Hebrew directly. And then the next sentence that is uh, written is, and it was when they were in the field and Cain rose up against Abel, his brother, and he killed him. I have created this space between the first uh, line here and then the rest of the verse. And that is by intention and because in the Hebrew text, there is that, uh, that uh, sentence, Cain said to Abel, his brother, and then there is no speech. And the next thing we hear is about Cain who rose up and Cain who killed. So we are in a place where everything escalates and it escalates in such a way that there is no more speech, there are no more words that are spoken. There is just destruction, murder, killing. On the next slide, I explain a little bit about this um, Hebrew verse here. So that phrase where we read, he said, Cain said in this case, or in other places in the Bible, it's some other people or even God who speaks and he said, this uh, specific phrase occurs many times, 2,691, according to my accordance uh, Bible program. And it is only here in our verse in Genesis 4, verse 8, where we do not have an actual speech after that introductory sentence. After saying, he said, we do not have a speech. There is what we could call an empty space. There is, uh, in, in the literary world, they call it a lacuna, a gap. In the Hebrew Bible, that is uh, present there. And yet, in most of our Bibles, we do have a speech in there. And that speech that comes because of the translation, um, the, the Greek translation, so from the he Masoretic text on the Greek text into to the not the Masoretic, the Greek uh, text to the Septuagint. Um, this um, Greek translation fills in that space with the words, "Let us go out into the field." And then, when they were into in the field, Cain killed. Based on this, and, um, there are no English Bibles that I have come across that actually follow the actual Hebrew text. There are English translations that follow the Septuagint, the Greek Bible, and they include that sentence, let us go out into the field. And the Bibles are the RSV, NRSV, NIV, uh, New English Translation, and several others. <clears throat> and then there are other English translations that make an attempt to uh, to keep the Hebrew text kind of like um, present and keep it alive, but they have to change the word he said to another word, namely the word he told or he spoke, he spoke to or he talked with. <clears throat> and by doing that, you can have a sentence without the speech. You can put a period after that saying he told um, something to, <clears throat> to his brother. And then um, there is no need for a speech. <clears throat> but the word to tell and the word to say are not the same. They are also not the same in English and also in Hebrew. And so the word in Hebrew is the word he said, which needs a speech and yet it is not there. So we are still working with Cain's action here, and we still have that question, is it directly tied to that matter of sacrifices? And yet there is nothing in the narrative that clearly make, that states that clearly. And then the next question, so still why did Cain kill Abel? 
And there are all kinds of ways of putting in some imaginary um, reason for that. Was it a quarrel? Did they fight with each other? Was maybe his action even unintentional? Or did Abel provoke him and Cain acted out of self-defense? So all of those things have been used to, to make sense of this, this part here. And maybe this for these kinds of reasons that, uh, that those billboards are up even today around the country about Cain uh, killing Abel with a, with a rock. Uh, others have Cain killing Abel with a jawbone. And they are a little older uh, versions of this kind of uh, imagination. So none of these uh, things are actually in the text, and so nothing is revealed about it. In other words, there are no words. The text is actually very silent. There is nothing to explain it. There is no reason for it. We have to learn a little more about these two, Cain and Abel. Another literary feature in the text is how the writer uses the names Cain is used 16 times, Abel eight times. And that is not by chance, that is by intention when something like that happens. Abel is half used of Cain <clears throat> as a name in the text. But then Abel is always Cain's brother and that is mentioned seven times. And on the next slide, I just cite those seven, seven uh, ways how the text gives us the description of Abel being the brother. She gave birth to his brother, Abel. Cain said to Abel, his brother. Cain rose up to Abel, his brother. Where is Abel, your brother, asks God, the Lord. Am I the keeper of my brother, says even Cain. And then it goes on, the voice of your brother's blood is crying, the blood of your brother from, uh, is um, going to be taken from your hand. <clears throat> and pay attention, uh, the, the first four still have the name included in there. Abel, your brother, Abel, his brother. But then as soon as the killing has happened, Abel <clears throat> is, um, Abel has no more presence in the text. He is, he is a vapor, he is a blow of air, and he's gone. He has no, no voice, by the way. In the text, he never speaks. And yet, the Lord says his blood is crying out from the ground. Well, he does not speak after he is killed, his voice is heard loud and shrill through the earth. So yes, Abel is always a brother to Cain. Cain is never a brother to Abel. That is another element that we can draw out from the comp composing, the, the, uh, the intriguing composing of this story. So now um, there is this dialogue that God continues to go on uh, to follow with Cain. And um, the Lord will ask, what have you done? Listen, your brother's blood cries out to me from the ground. Now you, you are under a curse. You are cursed and driven from the ground, which opened its mouth to receive your brother's blood from your hand. And when you work the ground, it will no longer yield its crops for you. You will be a restless wanderer on the earth. It's amazing that there is so much effort in this story to deal with a man who has killed the brother. An enormous effort in the text. He's not discarded. He's not left alone. He's not shut down. He's engaged. The Lord engages with him directly. And so Cain will answer. And Cain will say, 
my punishment is more than I can bear. And that is what our English Bibles will give us again and again. And in, on this slide, I want to make sure that we get that because <clears throat> that word here is not a word for punishment. It is the word for another word for sin. It's the word avon that we uh, translate with iniquity. It's that gr the greatest of sins, that one that is committed, has been committed intentionally, if you will. And that is great to bear, says Cain. And then that word to bear is the word that will be used in the, in the text about sacrifices also <clears throat> for the animal that is uh, going to bear the iniquity of the person who lays his hands on it. And it is also used in the same, in that way in, for example, in Isaiah chapter 53 of the servant, the suffering servant who bears the iniquity that is put on him. So to bear and to forgive have become synonyms in with that expression there. So I'm not suggesting here that Cain is talking about forgiveness, but definitely about bearing, carrying it. And that is a heavy burden to carry. And so he will, he will make some requests. He will say, how is that going to, how will I be able to survive? I will not because I will, um, I will wander around and whoever finds me will kill me. Now we, at this point, might come to ask the question, who is supposed to kill him? Isn't there just Adam and Eve and Cain, Abel is gone? Who is supposed to kill him? The, the story itself does not give us any hint to answer that question in this case here. So we are, not, we are not in a story that makes sure that there are only three people on the earth in the first place. That's not what, it's, what, what the story wants us to hear. And it would not have been also for those people who listen to that story told by, let's say, one speaker or even performed on a stage to the Hebrew listener, to the audience. <clears throat> He is really in trouble, and he will ask, whoever finds me will kill me. Rabbis have discussed this at length, and uh, one, uh, one story, on one rabbinic ex, uh, um, midrash, uh, in, in a way, in an attempt to help out on this, uh, considers here that Cain could have uh, not necessarily needed to speak of people, but even speak of animals that would kill him. But then Rashi, who does that midrash, is also not give, uh, holding that as that only one possibility here. And he is also not making the point that there were only three people on the earth and the rest were all animals. But it could be that whoever would kill him would act like an animal. The Lord shows a very different approach here and says that he appointed a sign on Cain. An appointed sign is not something that just comes by casually. That is a God-appointed element. And this is the first time we hear about such a sign. And when we come to the next story, which is the story that leads us to, to Noah and um, the flood and the destruction of the earth, and then we come out of that story and there is God again for only for the second time in the, in the uh, biblical stories who again appoints a sign. And that sign is the sign of promise that there will not be another destruction on the earth, the sign of the rainbow. And God is the one who is going to look at that sign and make sure that that destruction would not happen in that way again. 
Well, Cain is also speaking of himself as a person who wanders around, wanders around the earth. He calls himself a wanderer, a, va a vagrant. And God makes that uh, point as well. That's verse uh, 14. And in the very next verse, verse 15, you read uh, that Cain settled down. Uh, verse 16. And Cain went out from the presence of the Lord and he settled down and he lived or he uh, lived in the land of Nod. Now on this slide, you recognize the, the name for the land, N-O-D, and you recognize the uh, word for the wanderer, N-U-D. That those two words are directly combined, linked, as a noun, as a verb, as um, um, any a, a descriptive, an adjective, they are connected closely. It's the same root. In other words, the land of Nod is the land that should be also translated as the land of the wanderer, the wandering, the, the ones who wander around with an A, not with an O, by the way, right? And yet it is Cain who settles there. The, to listen to hear to that again in that Hebrew language where you have a person who is a wanderer settling in a land that is all about wandering around is clearly a paradox. There is no way to go around that. How can somebody who is a wanderer settle and live? It's an entire paradoxical telling of the story. And then to put a point on that, at the very end is to now find out um, where is that land? And it tells us it is east of Eden. And you have to go back to the final verses in chapter three and read about east of Eden. Because it is right there where God says, I, I will put this fiery turning around the cherubim here so that the entrance is close to the tree of life. And so here is where Cain just settles east of Eden in the land of wanderings, wanderers. <clears throat> in other words, he's not far away from that gate, if you will. He's right there at the entrance. Well, so far about Cain and his story. Um, we learn afterwards that he um, knew his wife. There is a wife for Cain. Again, there is no explanation who that is and where he gets his wife, but there is that wife for him. And she became pregnant, she gave birth. So it's almost a repetition of the story of Eve with Adam at the beginning. And she gave birth and um, his name, the name of that child is Enoch. And Cain built um, a city and called it Enoch after that son. And then that son, Enoch has another son called Erat. Erat has a son called Mehushael. Mehushael has a son called Metushael. And then Metushael has a son called Lamech. Here is where the story gives us kind of like an, a, an interlude. It puts, puts in a, another kind of brief story, a speech of Lamech. He has two wives and he has children from both. And uh, they, these, they, he makes a speech about killing, about revenge. His first wife, Ada, has the sons Jabal and Jubal. And they are, the words in the Hebrew text are very close to the names, the name that we learned about, uh, Hevel, Abel, Abel. The, the children of the second wife, Zilla, is Tubal Cain. Cain is, uh, is, is brought back into the generational line here. 
And then there is a sister to him called Naama. So with that, the story of Cain comes to an end and Eve will have this, the third son called Seth and it is an appointed son in place of the one that was killed, Abel. And it is at that time that men began to call on the name of the Lord. That's the end of chapter four. Now, what you have here on this slide is also the lineage of that third son, which follows right after in chapter five. And um, you recognize, you, you just have to make a little bit of a comparison of those names, how closely related they are, how, how similar they are. Enoch, and there is an Enosh, and there is also an Enoch, actually. There is an Irad and a Jared, there is a Mehujael and a Mahalalel and a Metushael and, uh, and Metushelah. And then there is Lamech and there is a, again another Lamech. And he, the second Lamech, will be the father of Noah. So gen uh, genealogists put next to each other in this way uh, give, us, give us something to think about. While Cain is the one who is, according to our way of interpretation, the one who is the, uh, leaving and is going away and rejecting God and so on, that's never what the story of chapter four has talked about actually, but yet it is in our minds that way. Seth is the one who is supposed to bring about the line of God's promised people. And yet the children, the names, the descendants are so closely related. In other words, we could draw the conclusion that Genesis 4 gives us a story of humanity where we are not so different from each other. Whatever we call ourselves, worshipers or non-worshippers, believers and non-believers, people of faith and people of other faiths or no faiths at all, in our core humanity, as enosh, if you will, that's the meaning of ish and enosh, the word for the man and the word for Seth's first son here, is that actual thing. To be a human being is part of everyone. So I have just a couple more things, then I'm going to close on the next slide. <clears throat> um, I, th that, yes, yeah. so Cain, who is Cain in the end? He is a human being and yet close to that gate of the garden. God in, in a direct uh, dialogue with him, never giving up even appointing a sign to him, in making sure that, uh, that, that he has, has, has a place to wander. Abel, well, Abel disappears. Where is Abel in the rest of the story? Eve will keep him alive because she mentions him at the very end when she said he was killed and in his place there is set. But Abel, is Abel gone? Because Abel is that vapor that is the mark of all of our lives as well. And then Eve, the mother, the mother of all living, sets, uh, sets the, the closing mark into the chapter, into the story with her, with her speech, with her promise into the future. So the Bible has taken this story and has used it in a very specific and interesting way. When you come to the famous book of Kohelet, the book of Ecclesiastes as we know it, it is introduced with the words of the preacher, the one who is 
calling the congregation together. And by the way, this one who calls the congregation together and is called here a preacher is Kohelet, who is a female preacher. The word Kohelet is a feminine noun. It's the, uh, the woman who calls the congregation together and she, she speaks and she will say vanity of vanities, Hevel, 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 all is Hevel. And there is the breath that disappeared on the field of Genesis chapter four. Let's go to the next one. And so Ecclesiastes will speak about this life of Hevel, that is the life of human beings under the sun of all of us, and will say that nothing lasts, no matter what it is, the good or the bad, everything will go to the same place. Um, even the animals, the humans, all of us. And so, in other words, the mm, climax of, uh, of uh, kind of like, okay, this is what, what uh, is recommended, enjoy life. Even enjoy life with the woman whom you love all the days of your Havel life, vanity life. Because that is all you got. So on the next slide, I, um, I used this in a class uh, where we discussed the book of Ecclesiastes. And so that life of Hevel is like, like a bubble. You poke it and it pops and there is nothing left. And my students were all intrigued by being able to translate that word with soap bubble. Bubble, bubble, everything is a soap bubble, says the preacher in this book. I believe I have just one more slide. With that, the story comes to an end. And to take this story and uh, use it in such a simplistic and unreasonable way and make it into a story about the killing of people where even God would be behind something like using a weapon for that is uh, definitely not appropriate and that uh, is one that uh, should never be done no matter no matter if uh, what kind of weapon we will want and to try to imagine and put into that verse in uh, chapter 4 verse 8 a, a rock a jawbone just a fist or um, anything else or even today a weapon so i was appalled by that by that reference and by that uh, by those signs that are published uh, published all over, and I wanted to make sure that we learn something more from from a story like this, something more that is far deeper that uh, brings up all kinds of questions that uh, we often have trouble to answer, questions that we may not even be able to answer, and should all be able to think about.